Welcome to another seminar series from the Blue Mountain Natural Resources Institute. I'm the Institute Manager, Larry Hartman. The Blue Mountains Natural Resources Institute is a part of the Pacific Northwest Station of Forest Service Research and is also funded by the Pacific Northwest region of the National Forest System. Our territory includes all of the Blue Mountains, including 10 counties in Oregon and four counties in Washington. The Institute achieves its success by working with its partners, which include federal, state, tribal, and local government agencies, as well as industry, environmental organizations, private landowners, and educational institutions. The Institute does three main types of activities. First, we offer educational activities and technology transfer, including seminars like this one. And we do research management tours, publications, videos, and we even sponsor conferences. Second, we conduct applied research, which is designed to meet real-world resource management problems. Third, the Institute serves as a neutral forum for discussing environmental issues so that people or organizations with differing opinions can get to understand one another better. This presentation exemplifies the Institute's goal, putting science to work. It's part of our ongoing commitment to bring science results to resource managers and to the general public. This seminar series is entitled Cottonwood and Aspen, Managing for Balance, Ecology, and Management, which examines the importance of cottonwood and aspen as components of ecosystem diversity. The second of the three sessions examines two subjects, cottonwood and aspen as wildlife habitat, a focus on birds, and silviculture and management of aspen in the West. I hope you find it interesting. We'll get started. Our first speaker this evening is, jo is Josh Tewksbury, and Josh is a graduate student uh, with the Montana Cooperative Wildlife Research Unit in Montana. He's in the Intermountain Research Station in Missoula, and Josh has a Bachelor of Arts degree from Prescott College in Field Biology, uh, currently a student in Organismal Biology and Ecology, and that's a heck of a mouthful. I don't know. I don't think I'd put that on a business card, Josh. <laughs> Josh's research background has been on uh, butterfly distribution in central Arizona. He's also worked on breeding bird productivity in cottonwood and aspen habitats in western Montana. And he's also worked on nurse plant ecology in the Sonor Sonoran Desert and the Mid Midrian? Midrian. Midrian Mountains. These are places I've never been, so I really don't know how to pronounce those. But this evening, Josh will address the cottonwood and aspen as wildlife habitat, diversity, importance, and impacts. Let's wel welcome Josh Tewksbury. Thank you, Bill. Appreciate it. OK. <clears throat> well, I'm going to focus today on that, the latter part of that, the research there. I'm actually currently still doing the work on uh, breeding bird biology in cottonwood and aspen. And I'll use some of that data from the first year of work we've done there um, in this presentation. <coughs> Deciduous riparian communities in the western United States, dominated by aspen and cottonwood, support some of the most diverse and abundant wildlife throughout in the western United States. From reptiles and amphibians spending most of their life cycle in these communities up through dominant herbivores such as elk grazing on the uh, or browsing on a lot of the lush vegetation and in winter using the aspen themselves eating the in inner cambium of the bark we find that these communities are truly the aorta of an ecosystem they're really where wildlife is most abundant especially in the west this is particularly true for birds like cedar waxwings here a large number of bird species spend most of their time, and particularly breeding, in riparian habitats. <coughs> and if you're walking through an aspen grove in the western United States in the summer, you might see a, an American red start up in the canopy or flitting around in the understory bushes. Red starts and over 50% of the other birds we see in riparian areas um, are what are called neotropical migrants. These birds spend most of their time on their wintering grounds down in here 
and in the west that's in western Mexico and Central America and then move up to the breeding grounds for, the, for breeding. <coughs> Notice for most of these species the breeding range is quite a bit larger than the wintering range and this may reflect greater and more specific resource needs on the breeding grounds where they have to set up shop and raise a family as it were. <coughs> so actually let me pan that out. In fact what we find is that most of these birds have very uh, strong habitat affinities and a large number of them choose to breed in riparian areas. Fully 60 percent of the birds that breed in the western United States or the bird species that breed in the western United States breed primarily in riparian habitats. And this is really amazing when you consider that riparian habitats make up less than 1 percent of western land area. So clearly this is a critical resource for breeding birds. Additionally, these riparian habitats are some of the most impacted zones in the western United States. And um, as an example, some states, some western states have uh, proposed that fewer, less than 5 percent of the historically, of the historical riparian vegetation is still exists, still exists today. Uh, in Arizona has, for instance, has stated that. So this is, it may be cause for alarm here given that we have a, a habitat type that's so rare, so critical, and has undergone some considerable impact in the last 200 years. What I'd like to talk about today is two general topics is basically the importance of these riparian habitats to wildlife and in particular to birds and then move to the threats we see to these, the, the quality of these habitats. What, um, <coughs> well, I'll, start, I'll start with the importance here. Why, why are these habitats so important to birds? What is it that, make, that makes so many birds congregate in these areas? And the first thing is productivity. These habitats are far and away more productive than any of the other uh, non-riparian areas we see in the western United States. And this goes for both aspen and cottonwood um, along river valleys. And if, if we look in terms of plant diversity and pl plant abundance, a large amount of plant species are, con are, are in, these, in these areas. And to understand this productivity, it's useful to look at the interface between aquatic and terrestrial environments. Riparian areas define that interface in, in the western United States and we see abundant nutrient exchanges going on right here at, that, at the interface between these two habitats. Additionally, uh, well, this then in, in turn creates the environment for lush vegetation to grow, plenty of available soil moisture, and we, we get the communities we see there complex in vegetation um, and with the complex vegetation come many, many bird species. The reason for all these birds congregating in this area, there's two primary causes. One is the insect abundance that we find here. Um, moist environments, open water, complex vegetation with, provide excellent habitat for an abundance of insects. And this is the primary food of most of the birds that we see in these habitats. Additionally, birds specialize on nest sites. Not every bird puts its nest in the same place. And we, that's evident when we look at anything from robins to woodpeckers. So in a complex environment like a riparian area, there are uh, many more opportunities for differing nest placements. There, so more birds can congregate in one area, especially when we can compare this to upland vegetation, which is structurally much more, is much more simple. There's only a relatively few number of places where you could place a nest and avoid a predator, whereas in the previous slide, there's a, a many, many places. <coughs> the second thing we want to think about when looking at the riparian habitats and all the birds they have is that not all birds are in one riparian habitat. In fact, habitat diversity is, is a key to why we see such um, abundance of birds in these, in these areas. And from just a structural standpoint, cottonwood and aspen habitats, focusing on here, are quite different. And um, cottonwood, uh, co or aspen habitats normally have a single layered canopy and relatively thick understory bushes underneath them, um, whereas cottonwood areas often are multi-storied with tall shrubs underneath the cottonwood canopy and providing different resources than the aspen areas. So, Birds, uh, birds oftentimes will specialize on a certain type of habitat there, taking resources from one and not another. 
And therefore, the, the total diversity of birds we see in, in riparian areas is actually made up of, of very diverse pockets that are quite different from each other in Aspen and in Cottonwood. Furthering this difference is the topographic location of topographic differences between Cottonwood and Aspen. Where I'm working in western Montana, um, Aspen occurs on these slopes up in here, and Cottonwood is along the large river valley in the bottom. There's only about 400 feet difference in elevation, usually quite a bit less. Yet, even with this small elevation difference, we see consistent temperature differences um, throughout the day in these areas. And especially in the daytime, and you can see in this slide, Cottonwood habitats are substantially warmer than Aspen habitats. This is temperature here in the day, just uh, the hours of the day on the bottom axis here. And at night, these habitats are also, they look quite similar here, but when we account for structural differences and take measurements at nest sites, we find that, um, that, at, that nests in Aspen, up in only slightly higher environments, are cooler. And this, this, might be, this might further the difference in bird communities and influence success of birds in these different areas, simply because nestlings and eggs are very sensitive to excess cold and heat. And we, we see differences in between species in their ability to um, cope with, with heat stress and with excess cold. <coughs> so these two things combined, looking at, uh, may both influence bird diversity and differences in bird communities between these habitats. And in, in the first year of data that I collected, and I realize that these are probably quite a bit too small to see, um, uh, we found considerable specialization in bird communities, such that the species up in here, and I'll read some of the names here. This is a, like song sparrows, spotted sandpipers, western wood peewees, house wrens, blackbirds, nest almost exclusively, the black here is cottonwood habitat, with only a very few number of nests, if any, found in the aspen area here. Conversely, things like solitary vireos, chipping sparrows, dark-eyed juncos, dusky flycatchers, American red starts, McGillivray's warblers, are found almost exclusively in the, in the aspen zone. And the other thing I want to point out about these habitats is just the sheer diversity in bird numbers that one year of searching for nests can come up with. We monitored nests for 71 different species of birds in these habitats. It's unlikely that any upland habitat um, supports near that number of birds. <coughs> so the importance of habitat is pretty, is pretty clear to bird communities. And, it's, and the different types of habitat are important to different birds. Species make individual decisions and responses to different habitat variables. At this point, I want to talk a little bit about, what, about the habitat quality, what allows these birds to successfully breed in these habitats, and threats to that quality. And the first one I want to speak on is fragmentation. Research on fragmentation and, and, and bird response to fragmentation has been uh, done almost entirely in the eastern United States, where deciduous forests have been fragmented and um, you get a lot of negative effects on bird communities. The difference here with these western riparian systems, cottonwood gallery forests, aspen communities, is they're naturally fragmented ecosystems. You see here they make linear strips along river valleys, and cottonwoods are found in small pockets, snow pockets, along small streams. So these naturally fragmented ecosystems may not respond to fragmentation in the same way. And at first, we may expect them to have a less of an effect to, to continued fragmentation. But in fact, <coughs> it, the larger stands consistently support more species. And, um, and this is true for both aspen and cottonwood. Because th they're naturally fragmented to begin with, but because of the area requirements of some species and resource requirements of others, we see consistently larger stands supporting more species, and drainages, in the case of aspen, that are larger, larger drainages having more species. So it, it, it <coughs> both at a landscape level and at a, at a stand level, area is an important effect, area has an important effect on bird diversity found in these stands. Additionally, natural disturbance has played a key role in rejuven rejuvenation and of these communities, both in cottonwood and in aspen. And there's a much less natural disturbance happening in these habitats than historically prevailed. For cottonwood, 
flooding seems to be the primary mode of regenera regeneration of cottonwood seedlings. Scouring of sandbars allows, much, allows regeneration of small cottonwoods, much like plowing your field allows you to then plant um, a crop. So without this flooding, we, there's a reduced regener regeneration in cottonwood stands, and the stands become much more simplistic, and you don't get a lot of the small cottonwoods. Aspen, on the other hand, is <coughs> not concerned so much with floods, but it does have, but natural disturbance in the form of fires seems to play a key role, and especially in the seral aspen, spans, seral aspen stands, or in uh, western Montana that I work with. Um, with <coughs> where I'm working, we're seeing a continual decline in the abundance of aspen on the landscape. And this, the process that is causing this seems to be a, an increase in conifer species moving up through these seral aspen stands, shading them out, and then causing a, <coughs> basically, it, the community changes into a coniferous riparian area. Conifer riparian is a, very, is a very beautiful habitat, but it doesn't support near the number of birds or other wildlife species as the deciduous areas. Additionally, because deciduous areas are so rare to begin with, their value can't be overemphasized. <coughs> so we've talked about fragmentation, lack of natural disturbance as both potential threats to the quality of wildlife habitat of, of aspen and cottonwood forests. Additionally, grazing in the western United States has had numerous effects on riparian areas. And there's <coughs> grazing, the damage the grazing can do um, comes in four basic forms, soil, uh, yeah, soil, uh, soil compaction, and uh, there we go, I'll just zoom in on this first part, soil compaction, foliage removal, physical damage to vegetation here, and elimination of riparian habitat outright through channel widening, um, erosion, and lowering of the water table. However, the impacts of grazing depend a lot on the intensity of grazing and the season. And it, it's been pretty clear that summer grazing, and intense summer grazing especially, is much more detrimental to bird species than is late fall grazing, and perhaps even early spring grazing before the growing season has gone underway. In a recent review of work that's been done on birds in grazed and ungrazed habitats, found that almost half the birds in these habitats show significant declines with grazing. And wh whereas 30% increase with grazing. So there's a very, again, species specific changes between um, the, each species responds individually to grazing. The nature of the species that decline is quite a bit different from those that increase with grazing, and as we would expect. Species dependent on lower vegetation levels um, are decreased with grazing. And oftentimes, these are specialist species, species that either specialize just on a certain vegetation level, and more importantly, often specialize on riparian habitats and aren't found in other areas. In contrast, uh, species that increase with grazing tend to be more generalist in nature. They're aerial foragers that, re that like open habitat, like bluebirds. And um, they're also open area associates. Robins do just fine with grazing. And so we see a, a general change in the, in, the, in the bird community associated with these grazed habitats. Visually, the difference in grazed and ungrazed habitats is pretty clear. This is an ungrazed site along the Snake River. And you can see that um, vegetation extends right to the water. And there's a complex multi-story canopy in these habitats. Contrasting that with um, a moderately grazed site, we can see that there's very little vegetation density around the base of the trees, where a lot of your lower nesting and um, ground foraging species would normally be. Um, it's also, it looks a lot drier, and that's maybe because of soil compaction. And so the, the differences between grazed and ungrazed sites are pretty extreme. <coughs> and the last issue I want to focus on here is, uh, is the surrounding landscape use. We know that these three, are these three issues here are all three on-site effects, as I call them. They're things that happen directly to a landscape. Um, grazing on the landscape, fragmentation of a certain habitat patch, or disturbance affects the area where the disturbance happens. However, the, the use of surrounding landscapes may also play a role in determining bird abundance and the health of bird communities in riparian systems. And this is, this is where I focused my research recently. 
And it's, it seems to be a little more less, less cut and dry than, than grazing and other issues, but have been studied a little, quite a bit more. Cottonwood Valley bottom forests are typically surrounded by a, a matrix of agriculture and urban development. Out here, it's a lot more rangeland than where I work and less plowed fields. But this is normally because these large river valleys have some of the best soils available in the west. So we see a lot of encroachment on these systems. In contrast, this is a, an aspen stand, one of my study sites I'm working in, surrounded by coniferous forest. And this is typical where I work, is the aspen is largely in the conifer forest. And uh, it's, um, oh, excuse me, let me get that back. It's in the conifer, the aspen is largely in the conifer forest and somewhat buffered from the effects of agriculture and, or somewhat buffered from the agriculture by this forest. Uh, let me back this out a bit here. Excuse me. Taking a, a more explicit view, this is just a, a coverage, a vegetation coverage map of a, a lowland cottonwood site that I was looking at birds on. And the orange is, is the agriculture around this site. Red represents more deciduous cottonwood dominated habitat, and the greens are forest. This is a rangeland out, out in this area on the east here. It's real obvious right away that agriculture makes up close to 40% of this area directly surrounding this site. And this is in dramatic contrast to the, the aspen sites that I'm working on, which are surrounded mostly in green by forest lands. And the red here is other aspen stands. It's important also to note that we do, I still see quite a bit of agriculture creeping up not too far from this. And the question I'm really asking is, what effect do these dramatically differing landscapes from here and here have on the bird communities that are breeding in these sites right here, in the, in the, in the cottonwood and the aspen sites on, on the landscape? And specifically on the health of the birds breeding there. How successful are they when they breed? The first process I want to discuss regarding that is changes in predator communities. We, we may expect predators associated with the uh, forested habitats to be different than those associated with areas surrounded by agriculture and urbanization. Things like um, uh, fox, coyote, squirrel, all three are efficient nest predators. And when I'm talking about predation, I'm specifically talking about predation on bird nests. And so those three, pre those are, ver they're very effective nest predators and they may be more abundant in a forested landscape slightly removed from agriculture. But in contrast, Things like ravens and crows, and especially magpies, as well as house cats, raccoons, um, are typically associated with agricultural landscapes. And we, magpies are especially good nest predators. And they're also highly, highly correlated with the presence of agriculture because they feed on everything from dog food to field, uh, field insects and nest primarily along the edges of, of riparian areas. <coughs> so when looking at these, things we see when looking at the, the effects of these different predator communities. What I'm showing here is simply the top graph is the number of nests we found in the different habitats. The black bars represent cottonwood, I mean, excuse me, the black, yeah, cot and the white, white bars are aspen habitats. And again, the aspen habitats are surrounded by coniferous forest, and these are much more surrounded by agriculture. The top graph represents the number of nests found. The bottom graph is, there, is a measure of success of these, these species here in the different habitats. The first thing, the first generalization that is um, important to look at is that high nesting density, where you see the most birds, doesn't necessarily mean that's where they're the most successful. We see this situation in both the yellow warbler that nests almost exclusively in cottonwood groves, yet does a little bit better in the aspen when it nests there. We also see it in the warbling vireo that nests slightly more often in the aspen, but does over twice as well as far as nesting success in the cottonwood. <coughs> Additionally, I want to point out um, a couple of species that, are, that these species only nest in aspen zones, the American red start and the Swainson's thrush. But their nesting success is quite low there. So predation invokes an individual response. Certain predators are better at finding the, s the nests of certain species. And we see, therefore, we see each species responding differently to changes in predator communities. Now, and we're going to continue to study that over the next couple of years to try and 
get a better handle on how these different species are reacting. Another process that might help explain differences in success of these species comes through when you have agriculture, you oftentimes have cows. And with cows, we get cowbirds. Cowbirds are nest parasites. Um, they have developed an interesting evolutionary strategy. They seem to have decided that it's a lot of work to build a nest, and it's uh, a lot of work to raise young. So instead, they opt to lay their eggs in the nests of other bird species. And um, the, this works out great for the cowbirds, because the other species uh, take the egg on as their own and raise it to completion. But it's often at the detriment of their own young. This is a, a, a cowbird egg, and this is actually a bunting egg in here, uh, indigo bunting. And what happens is the cowbird egg hatches much more quickly. And the, the cowbird young grows much faster and is much more aggressive than the young of, of say, a yellow warbler, a bunting, or whatever else species that is parasitized. Therefore, it starves out the other nestlings. And it's kind of a sad sight to see a yellow warbler feeding a cowbird three times its size near the end of the nesting period. But where you have abundant cowbirds, that's often the case. And um, in some areas where cowbirds are particularly abundant, Whole, we, we've seen local extinctions of species. For instance, there's no, no buntings down on my sites anymore. They used to be quite common there, <coughs> down in, in the cottonwood areas. Historically, it's definitely a part of their range. What about parasitism, then, in the different sites? In valley bottom cottonwood areas around agriculture, and in foothill aspen zones surrounded by coniferous forest, we see in some species that there's definitely a difference in predation rates between these areas. Yellow warblers do quite a bit, uh, get parasitized much more often in the cottonwood than they do in the aspen when they're removed from agriculture. And this may explain some of the differences with this species in success versus where they, where they want to nest. We saw before that they almost always nest in the cottonwood. Perhaps that was the best site for yellow warblers. But with the introduction of cowbirds, that the, <coughs> the success of the nest has declined and now they're actually doing better in the aspen because there's less parasitism. However, it doesn't explain um, things, what's going on with the yellow vir uh, with the excuse me with the warbling vireo, because uh, high parasitism in both in both areas. And what this points to, and what the general occurrence of parasitism in the aspen points to, is that you need you may need to be further away from agriculture to get away from parasitism. Now, if we just look at both these study sites that I was just pointing out before at, on one landscape. This is the one in the valley bottoms. Again, this is agriculture here in orange. And the green is coniferous forest. And this is the foothill site dominated by aspen up here. Notice you're only a couple, a couple kilometers from the agriculture. Cowbirds feed almost exclusively in feedlots, in fields, around cows. They grew up with bison. That's their general habitat, or they evolved with bison. And so they have moved in with the increase in agriculture in the western United States. And they need this kind of habitat for feeding grounds. But we're finding that they're, they're, they don't have much of a problem flying two or three kilometers to find good areas to lay their eggs. This um, is a troubling finding, given that it's pretty hard to further isolate stands of aspen once agriculture is close. And um, <coughs> so in general, in, in wrapping up the landscape section, it seems to be quite a quite a complex issue where predation and parasitism affect different birds in different ways. And there's no sort of uh, blanket uh, management decision we can make to reduce uh, parasitism and predation on, species, on all species at all. I want to kind of bring this around at the end here to talk about s some basic management recommendations that stem from the threats or impacts on riparian areas. That some of which are applicable to landowners of these areas, and others of which um, will require cooperative work between agencies and dip between landowners. As far as addressing fragmentation, a pretty simple re recipe is to try and preserve stands of the largest size possible. In at least a couple of studies in Cottonwood, they found that stands of seven hectares or greater support pretty much the entire complement of birds that would be found there. You don't get a lot no more species when you get above seven hectares as far as the size of a stand. You do lose species when you get below that. When we look at disturbance, um, the, rest, the remedies may be different for aspen than they are for cottonwood. As the, uh, and I think that uh, the disturbance in aspen will be addressed somewhat more by other speakers. But indeed, 
In aspen, it may, be, may require some thinning of conifers that are growing up through these serral stands. Or in some cases, managed fire has been used pretty effectively where I've worked in, in, in keeping the aspen on the landscape where normally it is disappearing. It's hard to manage floods. And that's really what cottonwood needs. And flood, uh, floods are usually controlled by dams. And most of our rivers are dammed pretty heavily. So from a landowner perspective, um, it's hard to do much about flooding regimes. However, a couple of things we can do, and the first seems a little counterintuitive when I say manage for beavers. Um, beavers ring cottonwood trees, and so first thought would be that they would be detrimental to the health of these systems. But recent evidence and some really interesting research has shown that when cottonwood trees are ring, um, ringed, they put out a whole bunch of nice little sprouts. Um, they're suckers that come off of the, the, the bottom of the, the cottonwood trees, and we see that on our sites. And some work has shown that it actually can increase the lifespan of a tree by suckering like this after a beaver kill. And it definitely increases the heterogeneity of the landscape, or of the cottonwood grove, because you get these small clumps growing up underneath tall cottonwoods, and without regular regeneration, those form the shrub layer in some areas. <coughs> So beavers, the basic take home message with beavers is they're not all bad for cottonwoods. It's pretty new as far as how good, th how good they are, but there's, it's definitely food for thought. Managing for flooding, as I said, would be difficult. But one thing we can do is trying to discourage building on the floodplain, because we can't get floods on a floodplain if people's houses are there, the loss of personal property and, s and such. So decreasing building on the floodplain can help, can help us then go ahead and introduce, uh, or we'll, we'll be able to sustain higher water levels and help regenerate cottonwood. And this also will allow for sandbar creation. Let me zoom this in a bit. Um, talk about grazing here. Grazing is something that people who have cow, um, that we can do a lot of management to really help out the interaction between grazing and wildlife. <coughs> The first thing is, whenever possible, just to exclude cows from riparian areas. That's not always possible, but it's certainly the most straightforward way of minimizing grazing impacts. Uh, when cows need to use riparian areas for water and um, for forage, eliminating the summer grazing may be most crucial. And what this requires really is just managing your riparian areas separately from your um, up surrounding upland areas. And you know, incorporating late fall and early spring grazing in riparian areas, but trying to keep cattle out of these areas during the most critical growing periods for the riparian zones. Um, additionally, we can use things like restrict restrictive access fencing and alternative water sources to help keep cattle out of these areas in high densities. And in many cases, what will be needed is riparian recovery and some regeneration, uh, re rehabilitation of these habitats through complete rest from grazing until we can manage both for grazing and for wildlife diversity. And there's certainly a case to be made that those aren't mutually exclusive. It, it, would, it will require a lot of work and cooperation among both conservationists and biologists and landowners and to try and pull those, those, two, resource, those two activities together. Surrounding land use, um, it's pretty hard to move your farm or move someone else's farm. And, and, uh, but there's certain things we can do to reduce the number of cowbirds on the landscape and potentially reduce the abundance of predators around agriculture. One thing we can do is just trying to keep feedlots at a distance from riparian areas. There's definitely been shown that cowbirds will parasitize more nests closer to where they feed. And there's a decreasing function of um, parasitism as they get further from the uh, feeding areas. Uh, additionally, buffers around riparian systems as far in terms of forests will help some species. It won't be a cure-all, but it will help some species um, as far as parasitism is concerned. The other issue really is reducing predator trash. And that's when I say predator trash, I'm speaking of the things that, um, like your dog food and other things that you can leave out in the, that, you, that left out increase predator abundance by providing them virtually unlimited food sources for, and this is for things like magpies, raccoons, crows, ravens. And um, just reducing that will help uh, reduce predator communities and reduce predation rates. So 
In, clo in closing, I've kind of given a, a broad brush of some of the important aspects of cottonwood and ha aspen riparian zones to wildlife and talked about some of the threats to the, these zones. Grazing, surrounding land uses, um, fragmentation, and, distur and lack of natural disturbance. And then some basic management recommendations um, for how we can better manage these areas to in the future see the same diversity of wildlife in these areas that we enjoy there today. That's all I have. Thank you. Questions? We have questions from the audience. Let's take some from our local site here first, and then we can go to the remote sites and okay. see what we have. Any, any questions for Josh? No Boy, questions. Josh, you didn't really answer all the questions, did I you? I couldn't have. I mean, <laughs> I just barely skimmed on a lot of them. <laughs> Someone's got to have a question. Who's brave out there? Sure. Okay. Did you look at cavity nesters as well? Oh, you have to push down your button. Or did you do it once? I'm sorry. Quit, quit pushing my button, Bill. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, we did look at cavity nesters. What we do is we, we, do net, we, we uh, monitor nests for all the birds on the sites. And so cavity nesters, we do see quite a bit of difference in the cavity nester communities between cottonwood and aspen sites because aspen provides excellent areas for a lot of your woodpeckers. They um, seem to bore preferentially in, these, in aspen trees. And they have species definitely prefer different. They, they're choosing the softest trees to find. To, to bore their holes into. So there's definitely differences in, um, the, in the woodpecker communities. And then secondary cavity nesters, such as chickadees, that use those holes afterwards. Um, so we did look at those, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I had a question. Uh, Josh, did you uh, notice in, uh, in your uh, uh, censusing of, of songbirds in, in aspen and conifer, uh, where, where was the highest number of species? Was it in pure aspen uh, or in mixed stands? Uh, I ask this question because that's what uh, a couple of researchers in Colorado found a number of years ago. Yeah, as a matter of fact, they found that the highest diversity was in the mixed stands, as I recall. And um, I have not censused um, a gradient of uh, coniferous, mixed, and then uh, pure aspen. So I can't address that directly. Although census, we have done censuses in the conifers and in the aspen, and there's a much greater diversity of birds in the, in the aspen. But looking at the interface between those, um, I, I can't address that very well. I'm not sure. Some of our sites have quite a bit of con conifers in them. And in a, in, through next year's data, we should be able to address that. It's a good question, though. More questions from Legrand? How about our remote sites? Do we have our audio bridges up? Yeah, John, this is the Dow. Yeah, go ahead, John. Yeah, I had a question about, have we got any experience with artificially creating flood conditions for regeneration of cottonwood, uh, perhaps using different kinds of site prep methods to create that seedbed that's similar to what a flood would create? I'm not sure if we have too much direct experience with it, although there's been lots of work done recently on regenerating, regenerating cottonwood, cottonwood habitats through planting of, of seedlings. Um, lots of work in the southwest that I know of, and there may be quite a bit up here as well. Um, I don't know about creating flood conditions. I do know that a lot of work has also been done on decreasing the rate of water flow through these areas, because when you have high water flow, you end up getting a lot of erosion, and it takes away the sandbars that are crucial for cottonwood establishment. So when we, can, when we put up um, barriers to water flow, we can recreate sandbars and then in that, in that way help with uh, cottonwood establishment. That would also ra raise the water table too in doing that, wouldn't Indeed. it? Indeed, raises the water table, definitely. Any other questions from remote sites? We have a question from Seneca. Go ahead. Yeah, um, Josh, did you do any studies um, on uh, you know, uh, nestlings by squirrels or flying squirrels? And if so, what species did you notice that they, um, they I don't know what the verb is. <laughs> um, are you, the predation by these squirrels, is that the question? Um, yep. Oh, yeah. Uh, by squirrels or flying squirrels. We have flying squirrels and um, 
red squirrels, tree, tree squirrels in our habitat, as well as quite a bit of chipmunks. I don't know the effect of flying squirrels. They're pretty rare where we are, um, but they, are, they do exist there. The squirrel, squirrel predation, it, it's difficult to observe a squirrel preying on nests, but we did actually end up seeing quite a bit of that this year. And they're throughout the landscape, and we're doing some work to see if predation rates are higher closer to s squirrel middens, which are and areas where they um, pull apart the pine cones and stuff like that for feeding, to see if predation rates are higher in that area than further away from squirrel activity zones. So we're, we're mapping squirrel abundance and um, their distributions, and then trying to correlate that with, bird, with predation rates. And so don't have the answer to for that yet, but hopefully um, later on this year, we'll have some information on that. OK. Other questions from rem remote sites? Question from John Day. Go ahead. Um, on the blues, we have forest grazing quite a bit in the summer. Do the cowbirds tend to follow the cows, or do they pretty much stay down in the lowlands? It's a really good question, and there's not been a lot of research to, to really pin down what aspects of cattle grazing and um, agriculture cowbirds are keyed on most. Cowbirds expanded into the west typically by following some of the pack stations that were created along the Pacific coast and then up into the inland northwest <coughs> um, later on. You can actually, if they're not actually as correlated with simply clearing of landscape as they are with pack stations, actual introduction of cattle, and, and open field agriculture where you have abundance of insects in the plowed fields. So it's, um, there needs to be a lot more work done in figuring out what aspects they're directly keying on. I've seen them a lot around cows, and they feed on. The reason they're around cows is they're a lot like bison. They, they kick up insects, and then the cowbirds can grab the insects when they fly up from the ground. So I don't think they'd follow cows into habitats that didn't have a lot of insects for them to eat. That's just a thought on that. Hmm. But, OK. Thank you. Yeah. More questions? Any from Legrand? Great. Boy, I don't know. Quite audience. <laughs> I think there's got to be a lot more issues I'm out sure there. I'm sure there are. But uh -huh. thanks for everyone for John that. John Go ahead. Yes, could you elaborate again on the summer period in grazing? I'm curious about the relationship of what's going on that's detrimental and also how that might pertain to big game. Excellent question, yeah. Summer, the studies that have been done on grazing in riparian areas, there's been about nine studies that have really good sort of grazed and non-grazed type treatments. And um, what those studies have found is that the summer graze, when they compare summer grazing and, not, and non grazed they find dramatic differences in both bird community structure and also success of a lot of these species. So that um, when you have intense summer grazing, it definitely seems to affect bird communities a lot more than in late fall grazing. The reasons proposed for this are basically because cows don't eat birds or anything like that. They trample vegetation. And it, the, from a bird standpoint, once they finish nesting, they don't need that vegetation as much anymore because anymore, most of them go down south for the winter. And if it's late enough in the season, vegetation has time enough to rebound next year to provide appropriate nesting habitat for those birds. As far as from a big game, aspect, I don't know the specific relationships between a big game um, use of, of riparian areas and grazing, although I could easily see them competing for some of that forage. So um, I have to defer a direct answer to that question to someone who knows more about the big game relationships in that habitat. But thank, it's a good question, though. Thank you. The second uh, speaker we have this evening is Dr. Wayne Shepard. Uh, Wayne is a research civil culturist at the Rocky Mountain Forest and Range Experiment Station in Fort Collins, Colorado. He holds a, a bachelor's degree in outdoor recreation and master's and uh, PhD degrees in civil culture from Colorado State University. Uh, Wayne is a native of Colorado. He's been with the Forest Service since 1969. His research career is concentrated uh, on the regeneration of subalpine fur and montane conifers, as well as the growth, development, and civil culture of Aspen. He is currently investigating uh, alternate civil cultural strategies to manage Aspen forests in the southern Rockies and southwest. 
Tonight he will address uh, civil culture and management of Aspen in the West. Uh, please help me welcome Dr. Wayne Shepherd. Thanks, Bill. Well, I think this talk is going to be uh, pretty much the Cliff's Notes version of, of Aspen management in the West. And as I uh, drove around here in the Blue Mountains this afternoon, I realized that a lot of what you're going to see is probably a little different than, than what Aspen is like in uh, Eastern Oregon. But uh, nevertheless, I think that uh, there's something to be learned from this because now we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, Aspen the Beast. Uh, how, how it behaves, its silvical characteristics, uh, what are some techniques that we figured out over the years to regenerate it. So uh, I think to, to get started, uh, I would like to reiterate something I think that you probably heard last week, and that is that aspen is probably one of the most widely distributed tree species in, in North America. It literally goes from Alaska to Canada. Uh, from uh, all the way down into uh, Mexico. There are a few uh, known aspen sites in Mexico. Uh, but one point that I would like to make is that at, even though we're talking about the same species, Populus tremuloides, aspen in the eastern part of the United States uh, grows and behaves ecologically a lot different than it does in the western uh, part of its range. And the reason for that is, is really the climate. Uh, uh, aspen in the west, uh, for one thing, lives a lot longer than aspen does in the east, and that's primarily climate driven. If we look at the, uh, the acreages of aspen that are growing in western states, and you'll notice that, that Oregon and Washington are not on here, and I apologize for that, but uh, the data sources that I got this from did not have any data on, on those two states. You can see that by far and large, most of the aspen acreages are in uh, Colorado and Utah. And uh, there's less aspen in, uh, in some of the other states. Uh, that, that, that reflects the, the development of stand conditions, as we'll see in, in a minute, as far as uh, whether we're talking about stable aspen or whether we're talking about aspen that is, that is really uh, uh, seral or, or short-lived on the landscape. Again, the red is, is non-commercial here. The split uh, between commercial and non-commercial acreages is, is probably uh, a little misleading uh, from this data because uh, technology has caught up with us uh, since, since this data came out. A lot of the aspen stands that were classified as non-commercial here are, in fact, uh, probably commercial today using uh, today's utilization technology. Uh, if we look at... Uh, Aspen as, as a multiple use species, it's probably truly one of the, one of the greatest multiple use species. We just heard Joss tell us about all the, the, uh, the benefits that aspen provides as wildlife habitat. Uh, but almost every resource uh, discipline is, is looking to aspen stands uh, to provide something to them. Uh, across the board. So aspen stands are, are really uh, uh, in demand, if you will, for uh, a number of, of uh, purposes. Uh, I'd like to first uh, start uh, describing stand conditions. Uh, again, these are stand conditions that are probably uh, elsewhere other than uh, southeastern Oregon. But nevertheless, it reflects uh, some of the development of stands in, in the western part of the United States and what we've learned about how aspen does grow and behave. First of all, aspen productivity is really a function of available moisture. Uh, and, and that can be translated into to weather, elevation, physiographic conditions, and soils. Uh, all of these things influence the available moisture, and that in turn influences productivity. Uh, probably more so than, than genotype, because you can get some, you can get a lot of genotypic variation, but you can still have some pretty good growth or some pretty poor growth, uh, depending upon the, the site that you're talking about. Let's look at Aspen's ecologic uh, position in, in uh, amongst Western species. If we look at uh, uh, align a lot of the western tree species in sort of a layer cake that would go from a warm and dry condition to a cold and wet condition, which also translates, by the way, to an, uh, an altitudinal gradient. Uh, aspen occurs kind of in the middle. Uh, if we would align a, a vertical line through this, we could sort of get an idea of what species aspen might be associated with. 
And uh, you can see that it is associated with a number of species, almost all the species on this, this chart. Uh, it doesn't have a pink color on this chart, which means that it is, is not considered to be climax. And uh, that's probably true, although aspen can grow as, as what we call stable stands, which can persist for a long period of time on the landscape. And we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, in reality, if we look at aspen on the ground, it, th th its position really isn't too much different than, than this layer cake. Uh, this is a slide of the Grand Mesa in western Colorado. If we start from the lower right-hand corner over here, we would see that there's uh, pinyon juniper forest. That grades into uh, gamble oak uh, woodlands. This emerald band across the middle of this slide right here is aspen forest, and then that grades into the purplish spruce and fir to the top of this slide. So the layer cake uh, model, if you will, of aspen uh, distribution in some parts of the west at least is, is not that far off. Uh, aspen can occur on the landscapes uh, in huge stands that occupy most of the landscape, a large-scale landscape mosaic. This is typical of stands in, in Utah and Colorado, again, which, which each have several million acres of, of aspen. Well, about three million acres alone in Colorado and, and about a million and a half in, in uh, Utah. Uh, more typically, I think, in many parts of the West, aspen occurs either in mixed stands with conifers, uh, as we see here, or isolated small stands that are they're either surrounded by conifers or surrounded by grassland or by uh, uh, other forest uh, vegetation types. Uh, just uh, for reference, uh, this is some data from a study that I, I did in Colorado a number of years ago. I've updated the ages here to be current ages, but basically uh, when I sampled a, a whole bunch of even age stands in Colorado, I found that, that if we were to revisit those sites today, the average age would be 110, which is considerably older. That's what we're probably twice as old as Aspen ever uh, gets to be in the Lake States, for example. Uh, one thing to note here is that, that uh, I found some stands that today would be over 210 years of age, and I know those stands are still there. Some uh, other researchers in Utah have documented that uh, stands uh, 210, 220 years of age. So aspen can get over 200, but compared to the conifer species, it's still a very short-lived species. The other point that I want to make on this slide is that there really isn't, I didn't encounter anything in my sample uh, less than 60 years of age to d in today's uh, age. Uh, and that's really, I think, reflects the, the, the history of fire protection throughout the West, is that we simply haven't had these large-scale disturbances on the landscape that, that favor aspen stands that uh, can allow us to, uh, to uh, see new stands appearing on the landscape. So that, that's something we have to be aware of because over time our aspen distribution is essentially drifting uh, to the right in this particular graph. Okay, let's move along and talk about regeneration. How does aspen regenerate? Well, I think almost everybody is familiar with aspen, uh, aspen's ability to re regenerate vegetatively, uh, but Many people aren't aware that aspen does produce viable seed. In fact, uh, a, a, uh, in a good seed year, a female aspen tree, and aspen is dioecious, you have male and female trees, uh, can pr uh, a female tree can produce over a million seed. And these are small cottony seeds, very similar to cottonwood. They don't have much endo endosperm. In fact, they hardly have any endosperm at all. And because of that, they require some very specific rege uh, regeneration requirements. And that, those requirements are a constant supply of, of water during the first growing season and bare mineral soil, a seed bed to establish and grow on quickly without any competition. And what better place to find that than in the gutter uh, outside of my office in Fort Collins? Uh, <laughs> This is an aspen seedling. In fact, if you look in the, the gutters and curb sides of many of our, our western cities where aspen is, is planted as a landscape species, you'll find aspen seedlings such as this. Uh, now, aspen seedlings also occur in, in nature as well in the wild and have been documented recently in the literature having occurred following uh, fires in Yellowstone on a fairly extensive basis. Uh, aspen seedlings do occur. Uh, that's one mechanism by which aspen uh, 
maintains its presence on the landscape. But the point I want to make here is that we, re we really can't depend upon uh, seedling or seed regeneration to manage aspen. We have to depend upon the vegetative regeneration to manage aspen. And that vegetative regeneration is a phenomenon that, that Josh mentioned called root suckering. This is a, a parent root. These roots, uh, there's a network of roots that, that run under an aspen forest. Uh, most of the time they're within uh, 10 to 15 centimeters of the soil surface. If something should happen to this root, it should be cut or the parent tree that's attached to should die. If something should happen to interrupt a flow of oxen down this root, then bud primordia that are spaced along this root are free to grow. And when that happens, then it sends up a, a sprout or what we call a root sucker. Uh, the other requirements are that, that that sprout or sucker has to have abundant light uh, to start growing and it has to have somewhat of an elevated temperature. So it, it, has to be, uh, it has to occur in a place where there's light and some temperature, otherwise the growth is, is not going to persist. So that's the mechanism by which aspen reproduces and it can reproduce uh, quite nicely. This is a picture of, of a, a group of genetically identical sprouts that have, that have sprouted up around the edge of a parent stand of trees. Here we term this a clone. And this is an aspen clone. All of these stems are genetically identical. So we're looking at one genetic individual here, one genotype, but not one physiologic individual. And that's a very important point. Uh, a lot of the popular literature uh, has it that, that we have this large, living, interconnected organism. And that isn't the case. It's, it's just as, as if you were looking at a, a Jonathan apple orchard, for example. You're looking at one genotype on the landscape, but you're looking at a number of physiologically independent individuals there. But when we look at that uh, on a landscape basis, uh, we can see in this case uh, uh, the coloration in the fall and leaf out in the spring gives us an idea to, uh, as to where these clonal boundaries are. This is a scene near Aspen, Colorado. You can see that some of these genotypes are pretty good size. In fact, uh, there's a genotype that's been documented in, in, uh, in uh, the Fish Lake National Forest in Utah that's 107 acres in size. And I'm sure there are larger ones out there someplace. Uh, but if we look at, the, look at uh, the interior of clones, we can also see these genotypic uh, uh, features uh, as well. Here we can see three different bark colors. This is sort of a yellowish bark here, white in the middle, green on this side. Uh, here is branching characteristics. This particular clone has not pruned its dead branches, while the one on this side has. You have very slender stems. That could have some meaning if we were trying to select aspen stands to manage for a, a peel, peeler wood product or uh, a saw log product, perhaps. Uh, here's a situation where we've got uh, stems that are very straight and erect versus stems that are quite branchy and broomy or bushy. Again, you probably wouldn't want to manage this stand for saw logs, where this would be a very good stand to manage for saw logs. I realize that sounds rather facetious to Southeast Oregon, but believe me, it isn't in Utah and Colorado. Something we do need to pay attention of anywhere we find aspen is that some clones, some genotypes, have a propensity to sucker with a m minimal amount of disturbance, such as we see over here, this sucker, uh, second generation of suckers growing under this stand, where uh, this stand here, there are absolutely no suckers under it. And clones like this might take almost a complete stand reinitiating disturbance in order to get any suckers back at all. Okay, that leads me then to uh, uh, Josh mentioned this serial aspen versus stable aspen. Now, these terms have been around a while. These definitions are mine. Uh, to me, serial aspen is, is something that will succeed to conifers within one, within one generation without disturbance. Uh, in other words, if something doesn't happen, usually fire, we can expect that there'll be a conifer stand there within a, an aspen generation, so within 200 years, if you will. And, and that disturbance is fire. We're really dependent upon fire to maintain aspen in the landscape in these situations. Uh, the opposite of that is stable aspen. And in this case, uh, I define stable aspen as stands which will persist for more than one generation uh, on a site. And these may or may not have had a fire origin originally, but the fire could have burned so hot that there's no seed source there. And uh, without a seed source, it's going to take many generations for the uh, aspen to, or for the conifers to reoccupy the site. So we can expect that aspen will be there for a long period of time, several aspen generations. So 
you know, 400 years or, or longer, probably. How might that happen? Oh, first of all, here is a, an illustration of, of uh, what we're talking about. This is a seral stand. Uh, conifers coming up through. Some of them are already reached the upper canopy. We could expect that the aspen in this, this forest would disappear probably within an aspen generation because there's enough shade down in here that the sprouting would be minimal uh, unless we got a stand reinitiating disturbance. Uh, on this side of the slide, you can see that, that we've got a, a pure aspen forest. It's a very extensive forest. There are absolutely no conifers in it. And again, uh, we would have to expect that this stand might persist on the landscape for more than one gener aspen generation. Well, then you ask, how does that occur? How can you possibly have aspen persist for more than one generation since it's a disturbance-dependent species? Well, this is one way right here. We can see that this particular aspen clone has had a, a suckering event occur underneath it. We now have a second story of suckers underneath that, uh, or uh, a second generation. This particular genotype uh, is one of those genotypes that uh, can, can sucker, and the suckers can grow uh, given a little bit of disturbance. And the dis disturbance could have been something as slight as a late frost or a defoliating in insect attack that just removed the leaves long enough to initiate that suckering. Uh, so this is one way that it can occur. If that uh, occurrence uh, is a little more subtle and occurs more on a, on a tree gap basis, we get a multi-storied effect, as we see here, where you've got really multi-storied stands of aspen, similar to the cottonwood that Josh described. Uh, and these do occur. Uh, in either of these situations, if you encounter those, you're probably in pretty good shape because that means the aspen clone is capable of taking care of itself. It really probably doesn't need much management intervention. So it's an important uh, point to, to, to be aware of. Here's another instance by which aspen, pure aspen forests can, can regenerate. We can see on this isolated clone that this side, there's a sucker event that's occurred and it's suckering up while on this side it's dying. And so this, this introduces not only the ability of, of, of clones in shrub and grasslands to regenerate, but a new concept, and that is the aspen clone as a mobile organism on the landscape. Because these things really then can creep amoeba-like across landscapes over time. And while we might see this aspen genotype here today, that doesn't mean it was there 200, 300 years ago. Now, the genotype could have been in this landscape for maybe a couple of millennia but it isn't today perhaps where it was tomorrow. So uh, most foresters are used to the trees staying put while they manage them, but that isn't exactly the case with aspen, at least over time. Okay, uh, going back to my study in Colorado, I encountered, I measured a total of 140 stands. I found that roughly 80% of them were even aged, and the remaining 20% uh, were either two aged or multi-aged. So, about a fifth of the aspen stands I encountered in Colorado were other than uh, even aged. And I think my, my experience since this study throughout other parts of the West has, has led me to conclude that I think that's, that's pretty reasonable. I think at least 20% of the aspen that I've encountered are, are other than, than uh, single age. So uh, these sorts of things have sort of been going on under our nose over time, and, and we tend not to, to think about them. This is an example of that. Uh, this is a... Uh, a uh, clone that's in the median of the interstate of I-70 at Vail, Colorado. And about 15 years ago when this slide was taken, the overstory suddenly died, just spontaneously died. And you can see this green band here, that's a sprout stand that's come in. And it happened at about a two year period and I've sort of just noticed as I've dro driven by that over the years how this has progressed. Today, there's a young aspen stand there. All of these stems that are dead here have since gone down. They're no longer visible, and it looks perfectly healthy. You'd have never known anything happened there uh, 15 years ago. So this has also been going on in some cases under our noses, but not very much because we would have found them in some of our surveys uh, as far as you, existing young stands, and we haven't, uh, we haven't found that. Well, let's talk quickly about damaging agents. Most of you are probably aware that aspen has a reputation of being a damage-prone species, and, and it really is. Uh, it's probably one of the most damaging uh, agents is, is um, stem cankers or, or fungal organisms that get into the, the stem and uh, will ultimately girdle the tree. This is a rather slow-going canker, uh, serratocystis canker produces sort of a, a slow-growing, ratty-looking target uh, 
on the stems. Uh, it does uh, reduce product value for some products, but it takes quite a while to kill the stem, so it's not all that insidious, although it, it can be a, a mechanism for ultimate death of the tree, if you will. Uh, this uh, slide shows uh, uh, Synangium canker, uh, the, and I apologize to any pathologists out there, the name has been changed and I can't remember what it is. The common name is, is sooty bark. It can kill a tree probably in a dozen years or so. Each of these concentric rings that you see up the tree indicates a year's growth of the canker. So you can see how fast it could progress. Again, it doesn't, the, the canker organism doesn't get into the root system and so we could expect new sprouts to occur. Uh, it would be uh, something that would cause stem mortality, uh, not so much defect, but stem mortality uh, if you were dealing in a product, uh, you know, something for uh, a commercially managed stand, if you will. Uh, this is uh, Cytospora canker, identified by the little white pimply pycnidia that, that grow on the bark. Uh, it is a, a secondary uh, infection organism for the most part. Normally, it kills trees that are already weakened by something else. Uh, however, we have found it to be uh, a causal or at least a contributing organism uh, into a lot of uh, sprout mortality uh, following some treatments that, that we've uh, observed throughout the West. So uh, it can be a problem, uh, especially with regeneration, but normally it's thought of in mature trees as a secondary uh, infection agent. Uh, this is Cryptosphera canker, uh, these sort of oranges. Notice there's sort of a really fast spiral here. It's a very fast growing canker. It can kill trees in a year or so. Uh, you know, a good way to initiate salvage sales, I guess. <laughs> uh, this is a rare one in the West. This is Hypoxylon canker. Uh, it's quite common in the East and causes quite a bit of mortality and quite a bit of uh, consternation to managers there, but it's, it's sort of an anomaly in the West. It does occur out here, but it, it really isn't that big of a problem in many areas. Uh, I, before I move on, uh, one last mention on the insects and diseases. There are a number of insects that uh, affect aspen. Uh, the foliar defoliating insects are probably the biggest problem. This is forest tent caterpillar. Uh, these insects can multiply, their populations can grow so, so fast that they can literally uh, totally defoliate a whole landscape in a, in a growing season. I've seen maybe 15 square miles defoliated all at once. The leaves will come back quickly once the population crashes, although multiple year events can cause a damage of the overstory and dieback of the overstory, but in my experience all of these areas always sprout back. So. If you're dealing with a stable aspen stand situation, it probably isn't that big a deal. If you're dealing with a mixed stand, uh, seral aspen, uh, you probably are going to lose quite a bit of aspen because the conifers are shading out the, the suckers in those areas. Uh, stem rots are a big deal in commercially managed areas and in recreation areas where one of these things might conk somebody on the head. Uh, they're not that big a problem uh, in, in some of the new, uh, with some of the new utilization techniques because uh, techniques, uh, such as uh, wafer wood and excelsior uh, can uh, take up to 50% rot in stems. And so this isn't a real problem with marketability uh, with some of the newer utilization techniques. It is for, for traditional round wood, peeler logs, saw logs, that sort of thing. Uh, so uh, again, it's, a, it's all a relative thing, I guess. Okay, I'd like to talk a little bit uh, about deteriorating stands. That's one thing that we really do need to recognize as managers to, to sort of categorize aspen as to whether we need to intervene and do something. And these would be stands then that, that uh, really are falling apart and uh, uh, they're not spontaneously regenerating. We need to try to recognize these. And uh, a good way to uh, do that would be to look at uh, at the structure of stands. Uh, as you can see here, this is a very open stand. You can see right through it. It has a low basal area. Uh, there is some mortality. I don't know if you can see over here on this side. Let me come out here just a little bit. There is some mortality over here. Uh, but there's no suckers underneath. There's no regeneration here. Uh, mortality is occurring, but the stand isn't, isn't regenerating. Uh, should be cause for concern. Here's a situation where we see a lot of elk barking on a stand here. Again, there's some mortality. This is a dead stem, that's dead, that's dead, that's dead. There's all kinds of dead stems in there, but again, no suckers in the forest floor. So 
something is going on here uh, that's causing uh, uh, the stand not to regenerate. Probably what is going on in this case would be that the stand is attempting to sucker, but the animals are eating the suckers. One thing we need to remember is that in many of our western landscapes, animal populations today are much different than wh what they were at the time that, that the, this aspen ramet generation that we see on the, on the landscape uh, was initiated. So we've got different animal population situations today than we probably had 110 to 200 years ago uh, throughout much of the West. Here's a situation where uh, this stand is again an open stand, is deteriorating some. Uh, let me zoom in on this a little bit. You can see there's two green clumps here three actually, uh, that's the only aspen regeneration in this particular area. Uh, cause for concern, something's going on and we need to, to find out what here if we were to, to attempt management, before we could attempt management. Uh, thank you, we need to lighten this up a little bit. Uh, in this case, uh, this stand has tried to regenerate but all these stems here are dead sprouts that have occurred, uh, sprouted up along the edge of this clone. In this case they died because of elk browsing. So here's a clone that is stressed enough that it's spontaneously trying to regenerate, but the animals are, are eating the sprouts. Again, it's a cause for concern. First of all, the stand is trying to regenerate. That means that something is, is probably wrong with the stand. And secondly, the regeneration is dying. Uh, we need to, to be aware of that. What the, the big deal about this is, is that if you have, especially in situations where you've got isolated asthma clones like this, if you lose those stems, such as happened here. Uh, this particular clone uh, died about 10 years ago. Uh, and you don't get sprouting or the sprouts can't persist, what happens then is you've lost the genotype. Uh, and if you lose the genotype, you can't get it back. Because you have to remember, in many of our western landscapes, these genotypes have probably been there for at least a millennia, maybe longer. Quite frankly, probably much longer in many cases. Uh, so if we lose one of these genotypes, we've really lost something. And uh, it's pretty tough tough deal to try to reintroduce aspen through artificial reforestation. We'll, we'll discuss why in a minute here. Okay, uh, regeneration silviculture. How do you go about regenerating aspen? We know now how the beast behaves. Uh, let's take advantage of some of those, situ those uh, characteristics and uh, see if we can deal with them then in our, in our the management activities that we choose. First of all, aspen is an intolerant species. I haven't mentioned that yet, but that means it likes sun. It's intolerant of shade. It regenerates vegetatively by root suckering. Uh, it self thins, uh, and by this I mean it behaves differently than conifers. Conifers you, uh, recruitment follows a logistic uh, uh, population curve, uh, and you increase the number of individuals gradually over time through seeding until you get full site occupancy. With aspen, it's exactly the opposite. What happens is that you will have the maximum number of stems on the site in that generation the first year following suckering. And it's a downhill slide from then on. In fact, it follows a negative exponential decay curve over time. So you're always losing stems from an aspen generation, an aspen population. And uh, that's going to occur then in, until something happens and you get another suckering event. So we have to be aware that when we uh, regenerate aspen, we have to try to maximize the number of suckers that we're going to get in the first year because that's all we're ever going to have to deal with for that next generation. Uh, and you're going to affect the character of your, of your next generation if you, if you don't try to maximize suckering. And then finally, we have to be cognizant that it's susceptible to disease, as we've, we've talked about. Okay. One of the things that you can use is commercial harvest, and I realize that's rather laughable uh, in, in eastern Oregon, but uh, I assure you there are parts of the world where aspen is commercially harvested, in Utah and Colorado, in Wyoming, uh, and very successfully. Uh, this is a slide of an aspen, uh, it's not a clear cut, it's a clear fell coppice unit, okay, because we're dealing with a low forest system, and the silviculturists in the audience could appreciate that. Uh, the rest of you can ignore it. Uh, basically, this is, this is a commercially harvested unit in, in central Colorado that was harvested with mechanical equipment in the uh, dormant season in the wintertime, so we didn't get any compaction damage. It looks like a field of wheat. There are 65,000 plus suckers per acre in this two-year-old uh, uh, stand. It's just beginning, just beginning its, its second, uh, or its third growing season here. Uh, 
you can see from this that, it, that if, you, if done properly and if you utilize landscape architects in your design, uh, there's, you, can, you can really do a lot with uh, a clear fell system. You can blend these openings into the landscape. They regenerate very quickly. They quickly assume the, the, uh, the crown character and the colors of aspen, effect, uh, especially in the fall. And so you can actually do some positive things through clear cutting uh, on, on landscapes if you've got the, the aspen stands to deal with. And again, this was a 20 acre unit. There were probably several hundred acres of aspen, pure aspen on this site that they could place these units in. So you have a lot more to, to deal with. One thing that uh, I've uh, tried to study in in, in uh, the mid 80s in Colorado was to, to use a bulldozer to tip aspen over because we had some stands that were not at that time commercially uh, operable and we wanted to see can we just get in there and tip the trees over and, and use this as a cost effective method of removing that parent generation and starting a new one because we wanted to break up the age class diversity in some of these landscapes. Uh, this is a, a slide that shows how one of the replications of that study you can see on this side this was a side that was dozer tipped. This was a side that was chainsaw felled. You can see the stumps there. So the, the dozer tipping didn't disturb uh, the, the land very much. It just tipped those trees over, just separated the stumps from the roots, and, and that was it. Uh, these fence posts here, there's a, a three-wire fencing treatment that we had, and then we left the slash in the back on both of these treatments as well uh, to see if, if leaving a slash on site would, would have an effect. The big result from this was, uh, if you look at this slide, after five years, uh, green is dozed, red is cut. After five years, regardless of the treatment, whether it was fenced or, or not, we got significantly more suckers in the dozed area than we got in the cut area. And uh, uh, we also found a, a fencing effect here. Uh, this is uh, fenced and unfenced. Uh, this was uh, where the slash was uh, left in this case and in this case. So that leaving a slash did suppress suckering because of the shading. Uh, so uh, that didn't work too well. But the, the big point was that we got this tremendous stimulation effect. And I hypothesized, as scientists are prone to do, that uh, this was probably due to the fact that we had removed those stumps completely uh, from the roots. And any auxin that had been left in that tissue of the stump, which is quite a bit of biomass, was removed along with it. And so these roots got no auxin whatsoever. It totally interrupted the flow, and that really gave these these bud primordia, bud primordia kick in the pants to get going. So in order to test that, uh, we decided to do a, 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 another study in Arizona, a ripping study. Let's not remove the stumps. Let's just remove the roots and uh, try to, uh, to leave some of the, the, the stand there. In this case, we had a very open aspen stand, a very park-like stand that had been partially cut about 10 years prior to this treatment. And if regeneration occurred, and it probably did, uh, it didn't survive because of animal browsing. So what we did is we went into this area. We fenced it, first of all. And then we, we went around uh, each of the trees, staying about 25 feet away with a, with a ripper. In this case, we had three teeth on the ripper. And we just, just separated all those roots. Again, those roots are within a foot of the surface. So you can easily get them with, with any kind of me mechanized equipment that could get that deep. After three years, this is uh, what we had. You can see the open stand there. We had enough light down in through the canopy that we were able to get the, the, the light and the temperature increases we needed. And we've got some suckers in there that are now up to 10 feet tall. Not too many, only a couple th thousand in this area. But we have instituted a new generation on this site where before there really wasn't much chance of doing it. And we wanted to do this without cutting the mature trees because this is a, a, a site in Arizona where this was the only aspen in the landscape. And wildlife biologists were very concerned that we we're going to be eliminating bird habitat and cavity nesting habitat if we were to cut these large trees to regenerate the stand. And so we figured out a way. We, we applied what we learned from the bulldozing study and, and successfully figured out a way to sort of have our cake and eat it too here. And it worked very successfully. This is a picture of, of another technique, the same technique, if we could lighten that up a lot. There we go. Uh, edge ripping. In this case, uh, the, we drove the bulldozer just along the edge of the clone here. This is an isolated clone in pine type, again in Arizona. It was in a on the edge of a meadow. These suckers are uh, one year old. This slide was taken three weeks ago. 
Uh, these suckers out here go out about a tree height and a half away from the, from the existing clone over here. So effectively what we've done here is we've not only regenerated this genotype while keeping the mature stems, but we've expanded the acreage of aspen in this landscape uh, quite a bit. By, in this particular case, we probably increased the, the area of this very small clone, and this is the whole thing right there by a, a factor of at least three. Uh, so you can increase site occupancy by doing something like this. And again, anything that would, that would uh, remove or sever those roots would do the job. In this case, we just had a single tooth on the, on the ripper bar of the tractor to do that. Uh, the effect then can be that you can actually mechanically, uh, through management, do what has occurred in this case naturally, and that is you get an edge suckering event away from this, this clone. If you have growing room around the clone, uh, you can actually expand the acreages of aspen in the landscapes over time. And so our ripping, uh, that last slide I show you with the ripping will look like this probably in 20 years as it expands. This is a natural occurrence here, but uh, we should get the same effect. Uh, I mentioned that you have to have light around. And uh, what we've done is, uh, well, before I get into that, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about fire. Fire is one of the natural me methods by which aspen regenerates. So is there a means by which we could apply that in conjunction with other silvicultural prescriptions? And, and the answer is certainly there is. Uh, aspen, pure aspen, as these poor souls are fi have found out, doesn't burn very well. It's actually used as a fire break by firefighters because uh, there isn't the fuels under a pure aspen stand to really carry a fire through. But if you've got a mixed uh, understory of conifers, as we see here, a uh, serral type situation, or if you've got a uh, shrubby understory, can we lighten that up a little? Okay, it's not gonna go. Uh, in this case, sagebrush, you can start the fire in the sagebrush and run it into the aspen and you can get a pretty good uh, situation. This is actually that mixed stand that I showed you on the slide before last. These uh, suckers, this slide was taken, let's see, uh, June the 21st this year. This, these suckers were leafed out about a week and a half. They were beginning their second year's growth. Uh, and you can see that they, this was all essentially the first year's growth in this stand following a, a prescribed fire and did a very good job of, of killing the overstory, removing the conifers, and regenerating the aspen. It was a pretty cheap way to do business too. And again, takes advantage of mother nature. One thing that we've tried in Arizona was to apply a prescribed burn to logging slash where we'd actually gone into this area and we'd removed pine. And then uh, we used the, the slash from the pine logging to run a fire through here. And as you can see, we didn't kill all the stems. We killed a few, but we didn't kill all the aspen stems. But this is what happened. These are one year old sprouts. Uh, the tallest ones were five and a half feet tall. This one in the foreground here, the leaves on that are seven inches in diameter, if you could believe that. Huge, it looks like a tobacco plant out there. If we were to pivot 180 degrees from that and look into the other side of, this, of the study, uh, this area from here on, this is burned here in the foreground, but from here on across here, that was our, our unburned area, the same treatment of removing conifers. Uh, we got very little sprouting, and what we did didn't grow near as fast as that where we'd burned. So we're obviously getting a fertilizer effect uh, from, the, uh, from the fire, as well as a, an additional stimulation effect from the fire. Uh, and that brings me then to the other point of, of can we rem remove competing conifers? And I apologize for the uh, spelling there. I did this real quickly. Uh, the extreme case of that is another instance in Arizona where we looked at the most extreme situation we could find where aspen was growing with ponderosa pine. And it consisted of a clone on the Kaibab National Forest that consisted, it was down to two live aspen trees, these two trees here. There were two or three dead trees in the center, but this was the whole clone. It was on a rock pile uh, west of uh, Flagstaff, about 20 miles. There was not another aspen in this landscape within four miles. So this was the very last presence of aspen in this landscape. There was pine growing all around this. So what we did is we removed the pine and we fenced it, as you can see here with the fence. That's all we did. We didn't do any stimulation. We didn't kill any stems or anything like that. We just removed the pine and we just fenced it to protect it from animals. And this, uh, if we could lighten that up as much as you can, please, great. Uh, this is what it looks like after three growing seasons. These are the same two trees in there, same rock pile, 
We now have, we've counted every sprout inside this quarter acre fence. We now have 227 surviving sprouts, the tallest of which is here in the foreground is 13.8 feet tall. That's a third the height of the parent tree in three growing seasons. And all we did was remove the competing conifers and fence it. The aspen did the rest. And this is the most extreme case that I've encountered as far as, as being able to bring things back. Okay, uh, there's a number of things that can affect regeneration once we've got it established. Aspen is disease prone, susceptible. Things like snow, and a lot of these crooked stems here are due to snow and disease. This is a, a Cytospora uh, infected stem here that can really affect some populations, but we can't do much about those because those are natural things that occur naturally in, in these ecosystems. The one thing that we can do something about is uh, animal browsing. And that, throughout the West, I think is probably one of our biggest problems, uh, and will be when we get into the seral stands, uh, which constitute a lot of the areas where the real regeneration need is. And browsing, we've learned, is, is really a, a function of a number of things. The location of the aspen, where it's at in the landscape, the season that the animals are, are on the site using the aspen, uh, the clonal preference. Now, it's, uh, some clones are much more tastier to, to animals than other clones. There's a decided clonal preference. And you'll see a lot uh, greater damage on some clones than others, and we'll see that in a, in a minute here. And what other available forage is there in the ecosystem? Some ecosystems, there is no av other available forage. Uh, riparian areas are a very good example, as, as Josh showed us. Uh, and that's where we, we have to be really sort of add all these things up and figure out what our potential for browsing is before we attempt any regeneration. Now, almost every aspen regeneration area that I've been associated with has had some browsing in it. It's just almost universal. But it's not a problem as long as their browsing occurs on lateral branches. The problem occurs is when the animals get to the, the main central growing axis of the, of the plant and uh, and tend to uh, stop the growth there. In this case, elk have literally broken the main growing axis of this stem. They've broken it off at about five feet off the ground. And uh, uh, to get at the leaves on the top, and subsequently these stems get infected. And this is what happens here over time. I'm standing next to one of the few surviving stems in this, this particular stand in Arizona. I might explain how this got to be. Uh, we, had a, we did a study down there, a fence removal study, where we wanted to find out how long we had to have a fence up before we could safely remove it. We had a stand that was uh, consisted of 20 to 30,000 sprouts per acre uh, at age five, the tallest of which were 13 feet tall. Uh, most of them were about eight to 10 feet tall. Uh, maximum diameter was just under an inch. We took the fence down after five years the elk moved into one genotype, one clone in this area out of probably a half a dozen clones, and they really liked it. And they did this breaking, and it looks like somebody took a highway mower and went through here at about five feet off the ground. Broke all the stems off. This brown that you see is the Cytospora infection that killed every one of those stems uh, because the top was broken. The only ones that survived were the ones that were big enough that the elk physically couldn't break them off, and those were an inch and a half or larger in diameter. So we haven't lost the genotype here. There are still probably two or 300 stems uh, in this clone that are still alive, but it, we've drastically changed the character of, of the genotype for the next generation because we don't have much to work with, and it's only going to go downhill from here. What would have happened had we not had the fence there? Well, we would have probably had uh, what is known in, on the Coconino Na National Forest as the Aspen Stump Meadow. Uh, this was a, uh, a, uh, a stand that was harvested the same year that the previous stand was harvested. It was not fenced. It probably did sucker. Uh, the animals got the suckers, and today there's nothing there but stumps. But in the meantime, the roots have died. So even if we wanted to, uh, we couldn't put Aspen back on this, uh, this site. It's sort of like Humpty Dumpty. All the king's horses and all the king's men uh, can't put the Aspen back. Uh, one thing that the, the Coconino has learned is that they have to fence in their particular situation because they have high animal populations and not many Aspen acres. And uh, every time I mention fencing to somebody that, uh, that is in that situation, uh, I hear the cringes. Uh, and, uh, but it's something that we, we need to face. 
in, in a lot of our Aspen ecosystems in the West, we're going to have to be faced with this because that's the only viable alternative. Uh, and it works very effectively. The Coconino here is using a two, a hog wire that consists of two flights of hog wire, uh, steel posts. They also utilize the existing trees. They use, uh, uh, let me get this out a little bit. They use, uh, put a, uh, uh, a board nailed to the tree or wired to the tree here, and then they nail the fence to that so that the, uh, actually they nail the board to the tree. That way they don't have any wire that grows into the tree and so they can utilize living trees as fence posts without any future damage to those trees. Uh, they try to get long flights. They're building these fences for $6,000 a mile. And they're going to have to keep them up about 10 years, and that requires maintenance. And, but sh we're, we're faced with that if we're going to get Aspen back. You can see what happens if you don't have a fence. Uh, Back to the fence removal study, the genotypes that weren't browsed because they weren't tasty, the elk moved to those after they'd finished off the first one, or the ice cream clone. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, those trees had not managed to grow large enough that, that they're now too big for the elk to break. And so this is what it looks like, in fact, a month ago when this slide was taken. Uh, we have now have about 15, 18 foot tall sprouts. Most of the dominants are at least an inch and a half in diameter. What we get is an extensive browse line, but it's just the lateral branches that are being browsed. We have very little mortality in there. We're still carrying over 10,000 sprouts per acre in this area. So uh, I think the lesson we've learned there is that if we leave the fences up long enough, we can, uh, we can get through this. Now, we're beginning to see barking occur in here, and the question is, what's going to happen from the barking? So we're going to have to follow this over time to see if, if that unravels the stand uh, later. But I, I feel comfortable with this because we've got the numbers here, and that's, again, Numbers are it when you're trying to regenerate aspen. The more sprouts, the better. Uh, in conclusion, managing aspen is, is really just like a chain. Uh, you've got to, and it's only as strong as the weakest link. Uh, you've got to, first of all, understand what's out there, what you're dealing with, uh, what it needs, and that comes in with the prescription process here. Uh, you've got to come up with the right prescription. Then you have to treat it properly. And you have to make sure the treatment gets applied properly in the proper manner. And finally, you've got to do the monitoring. You've got to follow up, keep the records to make sure that everything is going OK in the next generation. If you don't, the whole thing can fall apart. So uh, with that, I'll be happy to entertain any questions. Questions from LeGrand? Yeah. Push your button, Steve. Uh, we've got an aspen patch here that we're trying to regenerate. Um, We've got a lot of real dense grass and forb plants underneath it. Uh, are these going to compete with the suckers coming up at all? It depends upon how <coughs> dense uh, dense is. Okay, uh, I had an experience in Colorado in an area that we harvested in 1983, and uh, it was a very small clear cut, uh, but it was fenced and it it initially sprouted well, but 1983 until this year was the wettest year we had on record. Now, 95 is, is wetter than that. But as a result of that, we got tremendous understory growth. Now, this was a, a grass and a cow parsnip understory. But the, the understory was so dense, uh, in excess of 6,000 pounds per acre, okay, that when it went down from the snowpack that winter, it took the aspen sprouts with it, and they were under maybe six inches of, of decomposing grass. They didn't survive. Uh, and in that case, we got essentially a failure. We have maybe a few hundred sprouts per acre available, you know, there today. Uh, so yeah, it can if you've got extremely uh, dense understories, but I'd say in the average situation, uh, it isn't going to be that big a deal because, again, these things can grow five feet in one year. And uh, especially if we do something like a site prep to a burn, perhaps, to uh, uh, get them going, you know, uh, yeah, fall burn or whatever, uh, that sh you shouldn't have a problem with it. Uh, and again, our prescribed burn in Arizona worked just beautifully in that respect. Let's go to our remote sites because we can ask uh, Wayne questions after, after the session. So let's get the remote sites now. Okay. This is Enterprise. Go ahead. Uh, up at Duck Creek, uh, uh, there was an aspen I saw that was uh, blown over, and I went and looked, and uh, there wasn't any root spurs, but rather the uh, uh, rot was right up against the root crown, like it is in root rot in the conifers. And uh, 
there was a white uh, layer there, but it was so thin I could only feel the wood through it. I couldn't feel that it was rubbery like the uh, uh, white with the armillary and the conifers. Uh, am I on the right track and suspecting a root rot? You're on the right track and are suspecting a root, root rot, and usually that's the sign is you get wind-thrown trees with no root wad turned up. Uh, it's, uh, they just look like somebody, almost like a beaver chewed them off, you know, they're just, there's nothing there. There's no roots that are attached. Uh, probably is a root rot epicenter. Uh, in my experience, those usually don't encompass large acreages, although in some cases they can wipe out most of a clone. Uh, there isn't anything you can do about it. You're just going to probably lose uh, a portion of that genotype and you probably won't get any, any suckering. If you do look around and see some suckers are started, you may want to apply some uh, protection if this is a, a, a rare clone in the landscape, but uh, a lot of these root rot epicenters just, uh, just don't come back and they're just a, another gap forming process. Okay. Uh, I have a curiosity question too. Okay. Uh, there's a couple places that uh, I saw the uh, regeneration that was right along uh, the uh, well decomposed globs of uh, conifers. And I wonder when you say that uh, one of the requirements for the uh, shoots to get established is uh, uh, elevated temperature, I wonder if the decomposition of that wood can be providing an adequate elevation of temperature. It's an interesting theory, and, it, it, and I agree it could be. Uh, another possibility could be that uh, if, if that log afforded any protection at all from browsing animals, that's another reason that, that you might see the, uh, the suckers there. If, the, if uh, you saw browsing on the suckers or evidence of browsing, that probably was the reason for that. Uh, another possibility might be that that particular site retained enough moisture that you're actually looking at a seedling. Uh, again, I, I'm not familiar with what sort of moisture regimes you would get throughout the summer here, but if you would get enough periodic moisture that that, uh, that could be a seed bed for an aspen seed, you might actually see aspen seedlings in that case. Okay, thanks, Bob. Thank you. Uh, next question from the remote site. Question from Seneca. Go ahead. Hi. Um, if you, if a, uh, if aspen or dioecious, would the members of a genotype be single sexed or could there be both sexes in one genotype? No, they, they'll always be single sex. You have male clones and female clones. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of people that dig aspen to put in their yard uh, pick the wrong sex and they get the females and they have cotton blowing all over town. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? This question from Bird. Go ahead. Uh, yes. Um, are you aware of, or is there any research going on about the allopathic effects of aspen on riparian sites or aspen sites? I'm not aware of anything along those lines, no. Other questions? From Enterprise? Go ahead. Um, also, are you or possibly Josh aware of any uh, studies or observations that have been made of particularly bird use of aspen stands uh, having different kinds of defects in them? I'm, I can imagine the, the uh, rotting bowls, of course, would provide more habitat for, for woodpeckers and other cavity nesters, but in general, control of the agents that affect the aspen or availability of habitat, any relationships you're aware of? Josh is pushing his mic button. No, oh, you're not. You're not going to say anything, Josh. Just, just let go of it now, Josh. It appears that uh, a lot of the cavity nesters are strongly associated with those. We can't hear him. Oh. Yeah. Oh. He, he's got to try it. Maybe you have to hold it down. No, they said just push it once. It appears that uh, um, woodpeckers are using the the softest aspen, which are usually those that are, have undergone. Um, I've been attacked by certain like pathogens and stuff, and uh, I'm not aware. I'm not sure of the exact uh, type of pathogens that create the softest trees, but um, there's definitely a preference for damaged aspen, at least in Arizona, where uh, some research has been done on that. Did you get that? 
Yes, thank you. Okay. More questions? Another one from Enterprise. Go ahead, Bob. One of the uh, uh, things that I've wondered is uh, when you mentioned these cankers, and I haven't really been uh, seeing them, but most of our uh, uh, st stands are just clumps and pretty small areas, and I'm wondering if uh, maybe the uh, cankers in uh, uh, small clumps would be less apt to uh, uh, spread than they would in a large area. Uh, it seems that a lot of, at least in my experience in, in Colorado and uh, in the southwest, then a lot of, uh, when you get a concentration of cankers in an area, it does seem to, to, to localize. Uh, sometimes in one genotype, but sometimes across a genotype, but in a, in a localized area. And I've always advised managers that if you see a, an awful lot of, of cankers in an area, you probably should think about uh, regenerating it through a clear fell, because uh, that will allow you to get rid of some of the infectious you know, spores at least, and, and at least start with a healthy stand. Now where they've done this in, in some of our commercial harvested areas in Colorado where they have the means to do that, uh, it's been very effective and there's no sign of cankers in any of the new uh, stands, and some of these stands are now 15 years old, so they're large enough that the cankers could infect them. Uh, in the case of Cytospora canker, uh, as I mentioned, that does affect the, the regeneration uh, and it can wipe out uh, stands of regeneration and has in our experience. Normally that occurs in, um, in situations where the regeneration is stressed from something else, either too much moisture, not enough moisture, moisture too much browsing, uh, some other factor like snow breakage or snow damage or a defoliant or something has got in there to, to provide a pathway for the infection and weaken the stems and then the regeneration will get wiped out. But usually a, a good good uh, practice is if you've got large concentrations of, of cankers, you probably should think about regenerating a stand. Another one. Oh. Uh, north of Benedum Butte and then right by the lookout at Harrow Butte, why there's quite an area where the uh, drifting snows, uh, uh, this is my interpretation, have let left the low sweeping uh, 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 structure instead of the erect uh, stands of the uh, aspen bowl. And I wonder if they spread uh, into a flatter area, whether they will uh, uh, then uh, take on a different structure. Uh. I know exactly what you're talking about. I've seen the same phenomena in, in Colorado. And uh, the answer is yes, they can spread into other areas and sort of create sort of almost like a Krumholtz effect, if you will, in conifers, that ultimately the aspen becomes self-protecting enough that if they edge sprout, then those stands, the, the, the uh, stems that are a little younger on the edge can then survive and grow to be a, uh, a tree-like form. Another thing that can happen is that very severely deformed gooseneck sprouts can actually grow out of it over time. I often wondered for years how come I was looking at a lot of, of crooked, broken sprouts in these newly regenerated stands, yet all the mature trees around there were straight. And I, I figured the climate hadn't changed that much. And one year the ranger at Mancos was splitting firewood and he split an aspen bowl right down the middle and he happened to be working with a butt and log, and there in the middle of that log was a, a typical gooseneck, just like under your sink, hmm. uh, at the pith of that stem, and that answered the question that aspen can grow out of it. And in the ensuing years, since that time, I've actually revisited sites that were severely damaged uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago, and today they're just fine. Uh, so they can grow out of snow damage, but it is another mechanism by which this self-thinning, this exponential decay curve that I mentioned happens over time. Let's go to uh, LeGrand now for a couple of questions f for the benefit of the remote audience. Any questions here in LeGrand? Yeah, Josh. Yeah, how important is the individual genotype um, in Aspen, given that you do say there's sexual reproduction as well? Um, do we have any idea of how many new genotypes, how much, how much that's accounting for 
um, creation of new genotypes versus something we talked a lot about how we're losing a genotype. So how important really is that loss of that genotype? Well, I think it depends upon, uh, I, I think, you know, it, it's a matter of scale. If you've got a landscape that's got hundreds and hundreds of aspen clones in it, you lose one, no big deal. But if you've got a landscape that only has one aspen clone in it, you lose it, that's a big deal. You know, and that two-stem clone in Arizona that I talked about, that was a very big deal to try to save that. And we, we spent a lot of the taxpayers' money doing it, and fortunately we were successful. So it's, it's a matter of the situation you find it in. Uh, you know, there's always, because it's been documented that seedlings occur, there, there are always some new seedlings growing. And, and as you recall, that, that small isolated clone that was spreading, uh, that slide, uh, that sort of phenomena is going on all the time in our western landscapes uh, where it can. But uh, I think what we have to do is identify those situations where it's really cru crucial that we do retain genotypes and worry about those and just don't worry about the rest of it. It'll take care of itself. And I think there's plenty of genotypes out there to maintain a good gene pool, too. Okay. Yeah. We're going to have to cut it off here with one more question from a remote site. Any, anybody in? Uh, Baker? Baker, go ahead. Do you know if there's a critical amount of conifer crown closure that would inhibit suckering or establishment of a new clone? That's a good guess, and I think, again, it depends upon the clone, because co some clones can sucker uh, with uh, quite a bit of, of shading, and others uh, you've got to totally open them up. So it just depends upon uh, the particular situation you're in. Uh, normally, I think you would, you, if you create a canopy gap, you can, you can get suckering in a gap as small as uh, tree height wide and do it uh, quite nicely. So you don't have to create large openings, but you do usually have to create openings. All right, let's thank our, both of our speakers for tonight's presentations. Thank you.